The Powers Project. James, it's great to have you on the show today. How are you doing, sir? Doing well. How about yourself? I'm doing great. In fact, I forgot to bring my prop. I have a I have a big tub of coconut oil and okay. it's solid. And this is how I decide I'm going to judge my day from on from now on. If that if that big tub of coconut oil is solid, my day's good. If it's <laughs> if it's if it's all liquidy, it's not good because that means my air conditioning isn't working. So, <laughs> oh, man, yeah, yeah, I'm with you on that. It, it's 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 a rough one over here in Louisville today, heat wise. So, oh, I can imagine. yeah, yeah. Well, in Florida, is not not much better. So, <laughs> you might you might have a little bit more humidity than we do. I'm not sure, but um, uh, the reason you're on the show today is because you're a lawyer, you're an advocate. And you're a lecturer who uh, talks on the topic of um, sexual assault prevention and consent. And you go around to the different colleges in the country and talk about this. Yeah. And so yeah. with with college getting ready to start uh, across the across the country, I thought this would be an important um topic to talk about and get out there and, and it's very time um worthy as far as that goes uh, to get out there now so people know what to look for know because i don't know that a lot of people understand that this goes on on college campuses i'm sure they they've heard about it but they think that's one of those rare things so speak to that like how prevalent is this how aware do people need to be and what do they need to be made aware of well, I try my best not to throw statistics as that much because stats can be boring, but I think it's appropriate here. The stat is that one in four students in college will face some sort of sexual uh, misconduct in their time in, in school. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that one in four students are, you know, going to be raped in school, right. but sexual misconduct, I mean, it, it it's an umbrella, right? So there's a lot of different things underneath of that. Um, everything from rape all the way down to sexual abuse, which might be someone, you know, smacking you on the butt at a party that, and, and you don't like that, or someone grabbing you and you don't like that. So when we have that one in four statistic, that includes that type of stuff as well. So yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a very, um, you know, a very widespread problem. And one in four, that's just the stuff that gets reported. Um, right. You know, a lot of it doesn't, it never even comes to light for one reason or the other. So, that, so that's a lot higher than I thought it was. But like you said, that covers a broad spectrum of, of uh, uh, crimes, if you will, whether it be, you know, slapping someone on the butt who doesn't want to be slapped on the butt or if it's, you know, someone who's actually been raped or molested. So the extremes that we have that, you know, we're, that we, when we think about rape, we usually think about young, young girls or women out there who end up, you know, who walk home late at night and unguarded or whatever, and that's how they get raped. Is that the truth or is that, or is it more like, like in real life where it's, you know who the person was that did it and they took advantage of them. Yeah, I think a lot of times you're right. When we think about, you know, the crime of rape, we, we kind of revert to the Hollywood version of it. Right. So what we see in television shows, what we see in movies, um, I'm a big fan of The Sopranos. That, uh, I, and I remember The Sopranos when it was actually like new on TV. So I don't want to make myself too old, but I remember when, it, you know, new episodes would come on every Sunday night. Um, and I, I recently rewatched it. And there's one episode in particular in the first season where um, it's called Employee of the Month. And Dr. Melfi is uh, leaving her office um, and she's assaulted in the parking garage um, of her office. Um, she's drug into the stairwell. And it's a really graphic scene. Um, you know, it was hard to watch, you know, back in 2000 or whenever it came out. And I mean, I'll, I'll admit that it's even difficult to watch now. And, you know, it's not to downplay that because those incidents do happen. But on the flip end, I think you're more likely to, you know, have a situation where it is someone you know, um, where it is, you know, a classmate or, you know, someone in the fraternity across the uh, across the way or a fellow student athlete, um, a boyfriend, a husband. 
You know, I mean, acquaintance, you know, acquaintance rape is where some people want to put the, you know, those incidents under. And I mean, I guess that's a, a, a good term for it. But yeah, you're, I think you're more likely to see those things than you are, you know, the stranger with the trench coat lurking in the shadows. Right. And it's not just a, it's not just a problem that girls deal with, but guys also deal with maybe on a, on a much smaller scale, but they also deal with it. Cause I know you were talking about, um, there was a, there was a male student who said, Oh, uh, it would be you know next to impossible to, for a guy to get raped. And, and he had no clue as to what he was talking about, obviously. Right. Yeah. So I was, I was teaching uh, bystander intervention at a local high school and this kid, he, you can tell he's the class clown, the jokester. He puts his hand up and, you know, he's like, well, you know, that doesn't happen to guys because it would take like an awfully big girl to rape a guy. And I, I'm sitting there listening to him and I'm thinking, oh, okay. In your, okay. So you think that for a guy to be sexually assaulted, it would have to be from a girl. And I, I felt like my grandma was like looking down on me whenever I hit him with the bless your heart. Um, because I mean, no, that's, that's not it. It happens to guys, but it happens in, it, it happens in, in interesting ways. Um, so for instance, in, in my book, there's a chapter on hazing. Um, and hazing is a very large problem, especially in the athletic world um, on the high school level. And then even further, you know, up into some of the pro, um, some of the pro leagues, um, the hazing has taken a turn into the sexually violent um, side. So um, you'll have young men being sodomized with all different types of instruments from broomstick handles to the handle of a lacrosse stick or a hockey stick. Um, in the army, in, in our in our very own military, um, they report that sexual assault is the most prevalent and reported version of hazing that they have. Um, so, you know, same thing, you know, people are getting sodomized in their in their bunks or wherever they're at. Um, and it, but the problem is, is that we, we take this sexual assault, but we give it the name of hazing or we give it like a cutesy name, like saying like, oh, well, this is just tradition or, you know, like this is just what, what you do when you're a new guy, you know, and and it kind of it kind of brushes it underneath of the table. Um, but no, I mean, you're still you're still experiencing the same effects um, that, you know, someone else would be feeling as a sexual assault victim. Um, it's just making it a lot more difficult for you to come forward because certainly you don't want to be the person that comes forward and gets the team in trouble or gets the season canceled or, um, you know, you don't want to be called, you know, a, a, a sissy or something by your teammates. So it makes it difficult for men to report, to report some of that. Now, that's one way that we have sexual assault for men. Another is um, uh, incidents where there are female teachers that have sex with their male students. Um, it, it never fails. I see at least one story every year on Facebook where there is the mugshot of an attractive female teacher and underneath of it, you know, charged with, you know, sexual assault of a 15 or 14 year old boy and it never fails. I will go in that comment section and I will see people, where were the teachers like that whenever I was in school? Right. It's like, oh, <laughs> where were the child molesters? Is that what you're, you know, that's what you're asking? Because if this were a guy on there, then, you know, the comments are much different when it's a male teacher that has had sex with a female student. Um, but, you know, once again, yeah, that's sexual, that's sexual assault. I mean, there's an age of consent and you can't give consent under a certain age. And even if you can, you're in a position where it's an authority figure and a subordinate where that shouldn't be happening. So, yeah, it definitely happens to us, too. OK, so I have a ton of questions. And so let and but I want to be careful on how I ask this because I don't want to be insensitive. Mm -hmm. Um but let's get back to where the guys in hazing. I first off, I thought hazing was 
eliminated from colleges. I thought um, or that the majority of them eliminated hazing, that if you did hazing, you're going to be expelled from campus. Is that not uh, the case? Well, yeah. I mean, most colleges will be very quick to uh, cite their no hazing policy. Um, different groups, you know, will be quick to cite their no hazing policy. But I think as we probably know, just because there's a rule against something, I mean, there's a there's a law against drinking underage, but that don't stop it from happening. So unfortunately, even, you know, even whenever there are laws and there are rules in place, it still happens. Now I'll give universities credit because a lot of times they are very quick to act. Um, so, you know, if a fraternity is in a hazing scandal, there's a very, very good chance that that fraternity is going to be suspended on the spot. And in a lot of cases, that chapter is just done away with. So the reaction is, is, is can be okay. But what I'm thinking is, how can we prevent this stuff from happening in the first place? Like, how can we be preventative and proactive? So do you see the schools or the, the leaders of the schools maybe turning a blind eye to it, pretending that they don't see it? Or do you think they just totally, that's kept under wraps and, and they don't know about it? Well, I'll, I'll give you the best lawyer answer I can. It depends. <laughs> <laughs> it depends on where you're at and what you're doing. Um, there is a, uh, there, there's a documentary out called The Hunting Ground, and it's been out for some time, um, but The Hunting Ground really focuses on um, sexual assault on college campuses, and one story in The Hunting Ground um, is the, the story of Jameis Winston, the quarterback. Um, now, here Jameis Winston is playing for his team in a year where they would go on for a national championship. And he is the star quarterback and arguably the best player on the team. Now, you have put this student in front of a panel of people that work or are affiliated with the university at some, you know, in some way, shape or form. Um, I'll let you and the, the rest of the listeners or viewers kind of take it into their mind of whether you, whether you think that tr trial was 100 percent on the up and up. I know for myself, I'm a, I'm a huge college football fan. Um, so if you had told me that Teddy Bridgewater was accused of sexual assault when he was at U of L and asked me to sit on that board, I would, I'd, I'd have to recuse myself. There's no way that even as much as I want to, there's no way that I could do this fairly knowing that the, the star quarterback on my team uh, is, is the person that's before me. So I think a, a lot of times it really depends on the school um, and exactly who is on the other end of the complaint. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> so, and I could, and, and like, and you're right. I've seen that throughout the past, where you see people who are star athletes who who seem to get more than a fair shake on on how you know how things, the outcome of things. Uh, and give it a bit more than just the benefit of the doubt. And it's, and, and that's troubling, obviously, because basically you're saying if you're of a certain stature, you have certain, you know, uh, gifts that, that uh, people want that they need for to win, that you're able to get away with things that other people wouldn't get away with. And, uh, and I think obviously that sends a, a, a very wrong message. And, and the, and then on top of that, the victims that were harmed, there's no, there's no closure. There's no justice, you know, for them. So, um, so now they're harmed a second way by the system itself. It also makes it very difficult for students to feel comfortable coming forth. Um, so I'm a title nine coordinator at a university myself and it can sometimes be very difficult to, you know, you hear of, of, a, of an instance or you hear of something that happens. So the very first thing we do, reach out to, you know, we reach out to the student and a lot of times they don't want to proceed because 
they have heard numerous stories of people getting burned by the system. Um, so it makes it very difficult, I think, sometimes for people to come forward um, with with the issues that they have. So, um, so when I was when I was uh, introducing you, I, I, I was telling people uh, that you were a lawyer and advocate and um, and what you talked about. But I also should have added that you're an author and, and you're the author of a book called The Title Nine Guy. So if you could just give us a brief, uh, you know, um, understanding what Title Nine is exactly. So Title IX is the federal law that says that if you are in a federally funded institution, so that could be a high school, a, a, a university, a middle school, whatever, if you are in a federally funded institution, then you will have access to everything and will not be barred access to anything based on your sex, your gender, or however you um, choose to identify. Um, it also gives students uh, rights whenever they have been um, victims of sexual misconduct. Um, that's the side of Title IX that I work on. Now, there's a whole other side. Um, if you ever have anyone that's, um, you know, in college athletics on your show, they can tell you all about the other side. Uh, and the other side is really based on equality and equity. Um, if if the, the, if the men's basketball team has, you know, state-of-the-art practice facilities, then the women's basketball team better have something equal to that. Um, that's the athletic side of, of Title IX. But the, the side I work on uh, mostly focuses on sexual misconduct on the, on the college campus. Did you, ever, did you ever play sports in college? I did not. I was a, a, a rabid sports fan. Uh, but but just like poor Tony Soprano, I never had the uh, makings of a varsity athlete. Um, well, I did for a short while, um, and I you know, and I also participated in in sports in high school. And one of the things that I noticed is that as an athlete, the things that we that we're willing to put up with, the things that we see as being normal and part of the athletic world rest of society seems to think is extreme. And, and I, and I go, I don't think they have an understanding sometimes of why coaches do what they do. Um, it may seem like they've lost their mind or out of their mind or whatever, but you know, you know, I'll take Bobby Knight, for instance, when he threw the chair across the you know, <laughs> across yeah. the court and people are like, what is wrong with this guy? And yet I understood him. I understood why he did what he did. And I guarantee you every basketball player out there understood him and, and not one of them was upset with it. I can't imagine that one of them would have been upset because this, this is just part of, of, you know, of your coaching of, of being taught how to become a better player. And, and sometimes, you know, whether you like his tactics or not, I mean, the guy was a champion he, and he won, you know, several titles. So he obviously was doing something right. And, and, and I don't want to, I don't want to justify his actions, but I, I personally didn't see anything that was that I would have considered horrendous. And I, right. I know many people who do. So what I'm asking is, is this the same way with with sexual um, assault at times? Because like, you know, football players, you score a touchdown you get pat on the ass, you know, you hit a home run, you get pat on the ass, you get pat on the ass for just about every, every male sport out there. If you do something right, you're going to get patted on the ass. And to me, that was never something that I even thought about. Like it wasn't sexual. It wasn't, you know, I didn't think, Oh, I'd like that. Or I didn't like that. It was just part of the game is, you know, is there, is there a fine line there where you should know when it's being crossed? Um, yeah, I think so. And, you know, I, I think you hit the nail on the head whenever you said that that is just a, a part of sports, right? That's a part of, of the environment. That's a part of athletic culture. Um, you know, and, you know, whereas in, um, you know, another culture, you know, you might get, give someone a handshake or a fist bump for a, good, well, a job well done. Well, you know what, you scored that touchdown. There you go. You know, that's that's part of that's kind of part of the culture. Um, once again, I think we kind of get into where it depends. 
Um, whenever I ask a, a group of students, so for instance, I was doing a, a, um, a lecture with our school's volleyball team yesterday, and we were talking about um, we were talking about things that kind of fall under the sexual abuse umbrella. I asked them, I was like, hey, okay, so I want to see a show of hands, and I'm going to participate too. Raise your hand if everyone, if anyone has ever smacked you on the butt before. And every hand goes up in the room. The coaches too. My hand goes up. And what you can tell in that room is that some people who have their hands up are thinking back to a time where that was where it wasn't a problem. Um, you know, they turned, they probably turned around, saw who it was, and like, oh, uh. but then you see other hands in the room that are like, yeah, I've been smacked on the butt. I didn't like it one at all. Um, it was not welcome. It was not warranted. And I did not appreciate it at all. Um, you know, I can think of times where, you know, someone smacked me on the butt and I'm, you know, just like, I, I just wish you would stop um, versus times where, that was you know, my dad was doing it. It's like, stop. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but then there's other times where, you know, maybe I was very reciprocal to who was doing it. You know, I mean, it, 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 it really matters of what the situation is. So th that must make your job very difficult. And, 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 and here's the, here's the challenging part. I've got, I, I want to be careful. I say this, you know, I, I have a friend who, who deals in this, who's a psychologist. And one of the things he said is that oftentimes children who are, who are victims of molestation don't even realize that they're victims because it wasn't a, it wasn't a, a horrific event for them. It mm -hmm. was something that where they felt good, they didn't think good or bad about it. It just, it was what it was. And so because they didn't think of it as that way, it didn't, it didn't bother them. It wasn't something that affected them into their adult life, at least not where they were traumatized by it. Mm -hmm. So, when you're in these situations in college and if a person, like you said, there, you could tell there were people there who got smacked on the butt who didn't like it. And, and to them, they were victimized at that point, but to the rest of the people who raised their hand and go, Oh yeah, that's just, you know, because of whatever circumstance I was in, it just happened, but I wasn't assaulted. You didn't think of it as that. So it must make your job very hard to, to be able to separate those where, you know, you have someone come in and go, well, this person did this to me and I, and it was, un, you know, unwanted and it, you know, and I feel assaulted by that. Mm -hmm. And when, again, I guess, because I, I grew up in this world where that was just, you know, a smack on the butt was nothing. Yeah. Well, for me, every case that walks in my door is a, a clean slate it's a brand new case. Um, so I'm not going to compare student A to student B. Um, you know, student A may not have had a problem with ABC, student B may, may have had a problem with ABC. And I know I'm kind of getting right. confused with all the letters thrown around, but, um, but no, every single case that walk, every single case that walks in the door is different. And it's new because every single person is different. You know, the things that I enjoy, you may not um, and vice versa. But, yeah, you kind of have to go into a job like this, um, willing to view everything on its own. And the facts of every case is the facts of that specific case. Gotcha. Now, do you find like um, with the teacher, with the female teacher, that there's this sort of fetish this fetish i don't know how we I mean, fetishization of it i guess you might mm -hmm. call it um of like you said all the guys are in there well where's that where was that teacher i was in school like yeah. it's almost it's almost wanted and that's right where, where i talk about this like you know if these boys if they if this teacher had had sex with them they would be all about it so they're not so they don't even see themselves as victims because they're like this is something i would want yeah so if a person, and again, I get, I know by law that they could still be a victim even if they don't feel as one or see themselves as one, but mm -hmm. does that really serve a purpose? Like the, by, by saying, well, you're a victim, whether you want to be or not. <laughs> right. 
Well, first off, fetishization it is a is a miserable word to try to pronounce, and I <laughs> often kick myself in the butt for naming a chapter in my book after that because it's like, ah, oh, I can barely even pronounce this. Uh, so I, I I feel you on that. Um, you know, we have the I, I think the laws are set in place um, for for stuff like this for several reasons. Number one, um, you know. As a parent, I'm not sending my child to school to be groomed by their teacher. I'm not sending my child to school to date a teacher or sleep with the teacher or have any type of relationship like that with the teacher. I'm sending my kid to school to learn. Um, and I think most parents would probably, you know, agree, you know, with me on that. They're probably shaking their heads right now. Like, we're not sending our kids to school for the, all this extra stuff. Like, no, we're sending them there for an education. Um so you want to make sure that whenever you're sending your kids off somewhere for X number of hours a day, that they're going to be in a place that's safe, right. you know, like you want to make sure that they're going to a place where you know what's going on and they are going to have a good experience. And most importantly, they are going to be safe. Um, so you hope that the law keeps those students safe because, you know, the teachers can see, OK, this is the line. I do not cross this line. Um, so I think that's one reason that, that, that those laws are important. But the, the other reason, um, like I said, there is there is a whole lot of different um, effects that a situation like this can bring forth in a person. Um, those effects, you may not see them right away. But these are effects that could affect your, your dating, your romance life, the way you see other people, the way you interact with other people, your interpersonal skills for a long time, um, even after you've graduated high school. Now, you're a 15-year-old boy, you're a 16-year-old boy, 17-year-old, okay. What is on your mind at that time? You know what I'm saying? Like, what are, what are you really only thinking about, you know, at that time? You're probably not thinking about what your life is going to be in your 20s or your 30s or your 40s. But, you know, the world of psychology has kind of shown us what these effects look like and how they can affect someone's life. So, yeah, you may not feel like a victim right now, but later on in life, you know, when th those things start to bubble up a little bit, then what's it going to look like then? Are you going to maybe feel more of a victim at that point? Um, so I, I think laws like that are, are very important because, like I said, it is protecting, it, it is hopefully protecting our, our children from any type of that damage being done. And I think, it, and I think it's important to, to point out, too, that sometimes, especially with boys, they may feel like a victim. And, and yet they won't act like it because all the other boys are like, Oh, you, that's so great. You know, you're so cool. And you know, like, I wish that would have happened to me. So they feel pressure to act like, Oh yeah, they were lucky to, to be the one that was chosen instead, yeah. of, you know, instead of being able to express their real feeling. So. Kurt, there's a, there's a, uh, it's a little mini series that was on FX. Um, I think, did that was that last year? I think it was last year when it, when this came out. But it's called A Teacher, um, and it stars uh, Kate Mara. And I mean, it is about exactly what we we're talking about: a, a, a young, attractive female teacher who um, has a grooming relationship with one of her students, and it kind of it, it, it kind it, it shows you the relationship, but then it also shows you the aftermath as well on both sides. It shows her life and how her life's been affected by her decisions, but it also shows, you know, kind of what his life is. And, you know, being in this weird place where you have a whole group of your fraternity brothers calling you the man because, you know, you hooked up with this hot teacher, but you have feelings of guilt because this teacher just did two years in, in jail and you feel like it's your fault. So you have this guilt on top of your head. Um, whereas for this teacher, it was the fling, but maybe in your mind, it was like, oh no, this is a real relationship. You know, this is like a real 
loving relationship that I have with this teacher who is like 10 years older than me and married, this is like totally not going to work out. But there's a lot of things that kind of go through, you know, through your head. And it's very difficult when you don't have that many people that can be a support system and understand. So why is it that when it's a male teacher, a male teacher, you know, having sex with, with a student, that person's looked at as a predator. And yet when it's a female teacher doing the same thing, I even noticed that you use the word grooming, which mm -hmm. nobody, I, at least, you know, correct me if I'm wrong. I don't know anybody who ever said, Oh, that man was, you know, that man was grooming her or grooming him, you know, when he was molesting her or having sex with her, you know, they, it, it just, he's, he's, you know, being a predator, that's all there is to it. There was nothing about grooming in there. So why mm -hmm. is there such a why is there such a vast difference? Um, well, I, I, let me back up a little bit, and it's it's not just fetishizing women; it's attractive women. That's the thing. So when you go and you look and you see these mug shots, and they look like they could be some out of something from Cosmopolitan or whatever magazine that that you have, that's where the fetish the pronounce that word. that's where you, that, that's where that comes from um because there are there, there are other female teachers who have done this as well but you don't really see them in the top 25 or top 50 hottest teacher scandal lists that barstool will put out um whenever you go to porn sites and you look up teacher with student it's always you know it's 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 a hot teacher right right um you know it's not an average teacher um so i think that's where it, it comes from is like oh this is an attractive woman with power um for whatever reason that is hot everything else not so much and i mean that's kind of what we're trained to look at, we, we, we're we trained to think that, okay, a guy doing this 100% wrong, scumbag, skeezy, um, dirt bag, right? But depending on what type of media that you intake, you know, look at what, one thing, one show that, or movie I could think of was uh, American Pie, the very first one with Stifler's mom. Now, Stifler's mom wasn't a teacher, but, you know, I remember watching this thing in high school, like maybe I was, what, a junior, so kind of in my formative year still, and it's like, okay, hook up with the hot mom, got it, you know, and then you, and then you graduate, and, and now you're in college, and you had, I mean, we didn't have streaming pornography back whenever I was in college. You had to get on LimeWire. And I feel like I probably just got a virus saying LimeWire on the air. But um, but no, you have like all of this pornography at the at the your fingertips. And one of the most commonly searched for uh, categories is student and teacher right. uh, videos. So it's just kind of ingrained in your head. And then, like I said, you have places like Barstool that, you know, put their list out and, um, you know, kind of minimize it. Um, there's True Crime Daily. Um, and and I am a, I'm a, a huge fan of True, True Crime Daily. I, I think I've seen all their videos three times over. There is one video about a teacher named Mary Beth Huglin, I believe that's her last name. And throughout the entire video, the narrator refer, continues to refer to her being beautiful, the gorgeous teacher, the stunning teacher with the pouty lips. Um, she refers to the student as, as her boy toy, her dream boat. And I'm like, are we still, we're, we're talking about sexual assault here. So I don't understand why you're describing um, a child molester in that way, because if this were a guy, you wouldn't be calling him a hunk. No, you call him a dirt bag. So right, yeah. <laughs> and and and, and there, I think, is part of the problem is that even when when these cases finally go to court, the female teacher is usually given a much lighter sentence than if it had been a male teacher. You know. And, yes. And that seems 
less than fair, <laughs> to say the least. Once again, in, in the chapter in my book, you know, that's what we kind of talk about is that double standard and how that even goes into the courtroom. Um, there have been attorneys before. There's one specific uh, case that I cite in the book where an attorney stood before the judge and told the judge, look at my client. She is 5'10", long legs, platinum blonde hair, icy blue eyes. She can't go to prison. They will eat her up in prison. And sure enough, somehow that defense worked. Are you and she got off extremely light. Um, and it's just like, really? Like, like no, I, I feel like there needs to be what you do for one, you need to do for the other. Exactly. Um, justice, you know, the, the, the statue of justice uh, statue wears a blindfold for a reason, right? So, no, it shouldn't matter if you're an attractive blonde or an overweight, weight, bald guy um, who, who with a ink pen stain on his shirt. <laughs> what is good for one needs to be good for the other. But unfortunately, we don't see that sometimes, even in the court of law. Well, I think also something that we don't see is is that there's been this push recently, and I say recently, I mean the past several years, that everything masculine is being taught as as bad. Everything feminine is good. And and so when we believe when we start believing that, it's easier to put men in prison for the same crime as you know a female teacher gets to walk. Uh, because you know we're we're being taught this is a masculine problem this is masculinity at its worst it's toxic masculinity it's the cause and root evil to to all the bad things in the world including you know um uh, sexual crimes and mm -hmm. uh, and you know i don't know about you i just i don't see it that way i don't I, you know i mean obviously there is there are people who have toxic masculinity but i don't see masculinity as it, itself as something that's bad or or necessarily toxic it's like anything else that you have you use it wrong it's going to be wrong um and i think that 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 lends itself into that unfairness that we see when when punishment is it was divvied up and, and, and delved out to the different people that you find that females get off much lighter. And again, I'm sure the judge is sitting up there thinking in his head too. Oh, I wish that, you know, teacher would have been around when I was in school, <laughs> you know, and that's, and that makes it really challenging for any lawyer, I would think. Well, here's the thing when it comes to masculinity and I'm so glad you brought this up because like, I, I love any time to, I, I get to clarify. So masculinity in itself is not bad. But the thing is that, yes, you have toxic masculinity, but you also have healthy masculinity as well. A lot of people, when we talk about toxic masculinity, it's become so politicized and become such a buzzword that when they hear the term toxic masculinity, they automatically jump to, oh, so you're saying that being a man is bad. I don't like that. But what we actually mean when we say toxic masculinity is, is that, hey, look, as men, we have positive traits and we have negative traits. Everyone, every guy, yourself included, you if you thought about it, you could probably pick out a couple toxic traits that you might have, You, but you could also pick out a, a lot of healthy traits. I know for me, you see my toxicness come out um, a lot of times when I'm driving. Um, uh, <laughs> Thank goodness people can't really understand what I'm saying or hear what's going on in my car because it doesn't take much to uh, to get me going whenever I'm driving, right. um, or or long long unnecessary lines at Target or Macy's. That that's another one where, and I usually just limit it to breathing very hard, but. Uh, <laughs> But yeah, I mean, everyone has toxic behaviors. Everyone have mass. Everyone has healthy behaviors. Women have these things too, right? Well, they um, have masculinity as well, you know. So and they, you know, women, and I don't know what you want to call it. I don't want to know if you want to call it toxic femininity or right. or what. But women have both sides. Have both sides too. There's healthy behaviors and there's toxic behaviors. But going back to toxic masculinity, all we're saying is, is like, look at the toxic behaviors that you have 
and work on those. Um, the way I like to break it down for people is, okay, if we are getting t hung up on what we're calling it, if the if the the wording is what is bothering you and we can't see past the wording, let's call it something else. In life, you have gentlemen and you have assholes. Right. Everyone has the ability to be a gentleman. Everyone has the ability to be an asshole. We're just trying to look at those asshole tendencies, figure out where they come from, and try to figure out ways where we can work on those and turn those into something else. And I think whenever I break it down like that, people kind of understand, like, oh, okay. Right. You shouldn't be like that in the first place. I'm like, all right. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's important, and I appreciate you clarifying that. I, the only thing I will say is this. is like for people like me, you know, and even though I've been guilty of it, I really work on not doing this. But p there are people out there who make generalizations far mm -hmm. too often. So they'll say, all men, you know, all men are this. And it's like, no, all men aren't that, or all women are this, or all black people are this, or all gay people are this, or what, you know, they, and they, they like to lump everybody into one, one group and, and discount that not everyone is like that. So That's toxic behavior. <laughs> right. But here's yeah. the thing. So there are people who do push the extreme, like you said, and I knew, I knew when you described it and I was like, yes, of course, that's what toxic masculinity is. However, there are people out there who are, who are of the belief that masculinity as a whole is bad. Like it's all bad. There is no good masculinity and they're pushing that. And unfortunately these people are extremists and these people tend to speak the loudest and they tend to be on Facebook more than anybody else. And they keep pushing this narrative. And this is where you, I think for the majority of people that, that give some pushback, it's because they've heard that from, from people who are pushing that narrative. And yet mm -hmm. that's not the narrative that the general public is, is pushing. That's not what they're saying. It's what you just said. You know, we have our good traits and we have our bad traits. There's, toxic femininity just like there's good femininity you know we we, it, we all have good and bad traits regardless of whether we're male or female and then yeah. to push only one as being good and like and, and this is often the case where women good men bad it's you know it, it it doesn't lend itself to to making progress i think i think it just separates people more yeah absolutely Absolutely. Like I said, it's, it's become so politicized. I often, I often joke with my friends and say, like, do we need a masculinity rebrand? Do we need to rebrand this and call this something else? Because if I have to spend 30 minutes arguing over the terminology, then we're never even going to get to the meat of the conversation. Like, we, we, I've, if, I, if I have to explain the terminology to you, We've already lost, uh, and, you know, maybe we can come back and try it again at some point, but um, no, if you're arguing with me and saying, oh, well, toxic masculinity is, a, is an attack on, on the man, it's like, ah, okay, I'm going <laughs> to let you go ahead and you just do your thing and you believe that, but for the rest of us over here who get it, but it, 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 it can be frustrating trying to teach that. I will have to tell you, you're the first person that I've ever heard suggest that which is what i suggest a long time ago and i found there was a lot of pushback i was like no matter what your message is if you're if you're discovering that your message is being offensive to whoever and that's why you're not getting people on board is how you word your message is that more important or is it more important to get people to see the, the what the message means and get mm -hmm. them on board with you and I'm going to tell you, most of them are like, no, the message has to be this because there yeah. was so they were so sold on that message that that had it had to be exactly like that because they were there was something that was important to them that they that they kept that message in order to get that across. And yet they were turning, you know, people were turning away left and right because it wasn't well worded, I would say. It, it you know, and for me, it depends on what your what is your purpose Right. Is your purpose, do you, is your purpose that you just want to come across and be right? Or is your purpose, do you want to make a change? If your purpose and what you're trying to do is to put your fist down and, and, and say, no, this is what I learned. This is how it is. Um, then by all means, keep doing that. 
and you will succeed in your mission of coming across in a specific way. But if your goal is to change, you got to read the room. And then when you read the room, you can determine how to bring that message. When I started doing lectures for fraternities about consent and sexual assault prevention, now I walked in the first few times and I kind of went along the whole thing of like, hey guys, this is important because it's the right thing to do for women. Think of your sisters, think of your mom, think of your cousins and, and you know, really try to pull at the heartstrings. Um, and it, that worked a little bit, but whenever I put a little bit of reframing on it, um, and, and it worked a lot better. What I mean by that is I started approaching it as, Hey, look, you guys are fraternity guys. I'm a, I'm one of you. I, I was in a fraternity. I'm an alum. I, I, I'm just a few years older than you, but we're the same. And if you want to keep yourself out of a jail cell, or if you want to keep your fraternity out of the dean's office, then this is what you have to do. And it's very simple. I took kind of the the idea of, look, I don't, I don't care why you have decided to use consent. And I don't care why you have decided to teach your new members how to use consent. All that I care is that you have decided to use consent. Um, so it's less about why and more about that you're actually doing it. Um, how, you, how you deliver the message is how the message will be perceived. That's yeah, I agree 100% with you. And, you know, that's the, and that's the attorney side of you being so diplomatic the way you are. <laughs> I have a dear friend of mine who's an attorney and he's the same way. He's, he's one, one of the most diplomatic people. I go, I go, why don't we just tell him this? And he goes, well, Kurt, you know, <laughs> he gives me the <laughs> diplomacy. I would go, yeah, I guess that's better. <laughs> <laughs> right. We, we have a way of doing that. I, I tell you, um, you know, one story that really sparked me as to how to approach um, these students I'm talking to, whenever I was putting my little program together, the first place I went to, um, and keep in mind, I'm, I'm a law student at this time um, at U of L. So I go to um, our Greek advisor on campus and I, and I sit down with her. I'm like, hey, look, this is what I want to do with the students. I want to teach our fraternity men consent. And she tells me this story where there, there's, so there's an office on, um, on, on their campus that does all the advocacy work when it comes to sexual misconduct. And one evening they sent one of their student speakers to speak to an entire auditorium of fraternity guys. So you got about five, 600 guys that probably don't even wanna be there in the first place in this auditorium and you have this maybe maybe a sophomore um, walking onto the stage. So she so so you remember you remember that stat that I told you earlier, one in four, right? Yeah. So she takes the mic and the very first words out of her mouth are, all right, one in four of you in this room is a rapist. <laughs> Let's talk about it. See? And <laughs> and as you can imagine, that went over like a lead balloon. Right. Uh, if your goal there was to state a statistic and try to sound smart, okay, but now you've also done something else. You have united five, six, seven hundred guys who normally are bickering with one another, but now you've been not you you've united all of them against you and anything else you say from this point on is going to go over their head or they're going to be defensive about it um so when i heard that story i'm like okay yeah so don't go in there as joey the lawyer go in there as joey the fraternity alum who knows what you're going through and knows everything that goes on and talk to them in their own language and right. it's worked out a lot better well, something I noticed that you did from the story you told me is that you you took it from it being about their mothers, their sisters, daughters, whoever, and you made it about them. Where you said, 
if you don't, if you don't want to go to jail, if you don't want your fraternity at, 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 in Dean's office, if you don't, you know, and then they, they, because we tend as humans, and I, I don't know if this is across the, the globe, but I would imagine it is pretty much, but especially in this country, it, it, in order for people to care about anything, it has to pertain to them. Otherwise, right. they don't care. Absolutely. I'm, I'm, I'm working on a, I'm working on a conference lecture about that right now is how can we get men to kind of step on the forefront of the line? Because, you know, one of the, one of my favorite quotes, uh, it comes from a book called We Believe You. uh, And the quote says that we need men to help. If women could stop sexual assault, we would have already done it by now. Right. We need men to help us and to step on that front line and hold each other accountable. But like you said, <clears throat> sometimes you don't care about something unless it affects you. Okay, cool. Well, then if you don't care about it for them, let it, let me tell you all the ways that men are sexually assaulted, just like what we talked about earlier. Right. Are you shocked? Are you appalled? Okay, let's talk about how to fix it. Oh, you agree that's how we should fix it? Cool. Let's do that for them too. Let's bring the women back into it and let's right. do it across the board because now you know you know the effects, you know what we need to do. So let's just do it for everybody. And you know, maybe we can maybe maybe we can make it a little bit more change. Well, I hope for for your sake that works because that I mean, you know, it it is important that change happens for everyone. Yeah. And not just, uh, not just yourself or, you know, because it affects you now. Yeah. I asked you when we, when we first talked, I, I asked you about the fact, did, um, did you ever see any abuse with title nine where there are false accusations out there, um, you know, towards students or, or, or faculty or whatever that didn't happen and come to find out later on that it, it did happen. Um, that's rare. I'm sorry. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Did I, did I cut out? No, no, no. I, I I said it wrong. I said that you know that they were accused of doing something, but later on found out that they, they didn't do anything wrong. Yeah. So the whole idea of the false accusation, um, it is rare, but it does happen. Um, you, you know, as when, and I think I may have told you the story when we spoke. Whenever I was on this. And now this is whenever I'm a student in law school, but whenever I'm in on the student conduct hearing uh, board at my school, we had a situation where there was a, a young guy that came in. He was a player on the football team. And um, we would always get these dossiers before every case. So, you know, you flip into the dossiers and it has all the information about the case, police reports anything and everything that we need to be up to date with what's going on, um, what's going on before we actually get into it. And I'm flipping through the back and I see pictures of this woman's neck. Now, I know what a hickey looks like, but this thing is like going like all down the side. And I'm like, what am I looking at here? Oh, those are hickeys. I'm like, did a T-Rex leave them? Like, that is huge. And I'm like, okay, all right, this is interesting. And what we found and what we found out towards the end after we looked at all the evidence and we did all the te- uh, heard all the testimony and everything was that this was less of a situation um, of, of non-consensual sex. And it was more of a situation of, I'm upset with you because you didn't call me back for several weeks afterwards. Um, so yes, it happens. But like I said, that's that's rare. Um, and in the six, seven years that I've been doing this stuff, like that's the only situation that I've seen where the evidence pointed to it being false. So it's it's, it is a rare thing then. So, because I know a lot of people go, well, what if, you know, what if they're lying and, you know, why should we always believe women, you know, all the time without, you know, preponderance of, of proof to say that this person actually did it because in our country, we're supposed to say the person is innocent until proven guilty. And with like the me too movement, they want you to just 
throw that out the window and just believe the female. And uh, you said something to me that I thought was very profound uh, when I when I mentioned that. And um, I don't remember what it was right now. But it was uh, well, what I said was is that, especially for me, kind of in the role that I am, it's important for me to listen to women. Listen to anyone, really, because like I said, I mean, let, let's broaden this out a little bit. I mean, let's take it even beyond women. I mean, the men, too. But to listen to when that case comes in your door or when you get that phone call at two in the morning or, you know, when you're sitting down for coffee in the middle of the day and someone says, hey, can I tell you something? It's important that we listen. Um, now, the lawyer side of me, there is a whole fact finding thing that comes after the listening. Um, I have to determine, you know, kind of what, um, you know, what has happened here and, and if there is evidence and which direction that we need to go in. But in order for me to get to that point where I can bring us to some level of justice one way or the other, it all starts by me listening and not pushing things under the rug, not diminishing anyone, not diminishing, um, you know, people's feelings or what they're saying at the offset, but to really sit down and listen. Um, I think that's one of the issues, um, you know, when people were upset with the Brett Kavanaugh situation, that was one of the things I think that people were really upset about was the the investigation um and you know i'm like i said i'm, I'm in kentucky so um oh mitch oh mitch uh but um you know the the so-called investigation well if you were going to do an investigation well then you have a whole federal bureau of investigations so why not bring them in why not call with the witnesses that we that you know people are saying to call why not why exclude this piece of evidence or that piece of evidence if you're going to do a, a an investigation give us a real one not a kangaroo court and i think that's one thing that people were really upset about was like oh we're going to investigate this for two days and then afterwards we'll be able to say we did so and then we can still let our guy in um regardless of of what may or may not have happened um that is a um that that's an instance of not listening um so that that that's where i that's where i kind of fall in it um is listen to listen to women listen to everybody right and that and that's what you said and i thought you know that's that's what's important is that that women are listened to. I don't mm -hmm. necessarily think that, you know, you discount or approve their, you know, what they've said, but you listen to them and then investigate, like you said, it's unfortunate though, especially on, on, you know, the level of, of politics or, or, or things of that nature is that the system is so rigged that, you know, like you said, Mitch McConnell wasn't going to let there be a real investigation of, of Brett Kavanaugh, you mm -hmm. know, the same thing's going on with Jim Jordan of Ohio, Matt Gates of Florida, uh, you know, even Joe Biden and Donald Trump and, and how they handle people and, and fondle people in public. I just go, wow, how do how do you allow this behavior? And, you know, and these are presidents of the United States and, and you can try to dismiss, you know, what they're doing as, oh, it's just harmless. But if that were you or me up there doing that, people were like, what's he doing? You know, fondling this girl or fondling that boy or whatever, you know, it would, it would just, people would be outraged, but because uh, they're people of power, it's okay. Yeah. And it's important. And I, you hit it. It's important to, to, to note that it does go both ways because look, you know, the ele election 2020, you, as much as I wanted a brand new president at that time, it's like, but this guy has these accusations. Are we listening to the women that are making these accusations or are we just going to not listen? Are we gonna just plug our ears because we want a new change in the administration yep. so bad? 
I do not believe that we listened to those women and to those accusations, because if we had of, there would have been a little bit more of an investigation instead of not having any at all. Right. I, I completely agree. They didn't want, they didn't want to hear the answers because then that would, that would upset their whole, their whole plan of, well, I won't get into it because that's all about politics, <laughs> but you're right. But it just, it's completely unfair. And, 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 you know, for me, I rem- I remember the first time I I had seen a woman completely just you know dismissed was um, during Clarence Thomas with uh, Anita uh, I can't remember her name right now it's been a long time but Clarence <laughs> Thomas when when Anita and I apologize for forgetting her name when she charged you know you know the sexual misconduct that he had committed and she just was simply dismissed wasn't listened to at all you know and um it's unfortunate that women have to deal with this on that level yeah yeah i mean it's and especially you know since you know we're in the political world um right now in 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 our discussion there is a whole other layer that goes you know over top of that because you know, whether you're um, Anita Hill or you. um, <laughs> anyone else, it's already it's already a, a a kind of off environment in politics for women anyway. But now you tack on sexual harassment that that might go on, and it's like, okay, what do I do? Do I report this? Well, yeah, you would think, okay, let me report it. But if I report it, am I shooting my own political career in the foot? You know, I interviewed um, I interviewed someone for one of my articles, um, and you know, she had been sexually harassed by um, uh, by a state rep here in Kentucky. And so I asked her, "Did you report it?" She said, "No." I asked why. She said, well, ho- my hope is that one day that I can get voted into office. And I know that if I report this and I make a big deal out of this, then that is going to sour and sully my name in the very halls that I want to come work in. So it's like, geez, Louise, like it's already difficult enough to report this stuff anyway, but now you, you have to you know, put that extra layer to think that your entire career could be over before it even started. You could, you could come out of that, you could come out of that accusation and investigation and trial, you could come out of it on the winning side and still lose. Because even though you were found to be the one that was right in the trial or in the hearing, well, now you have that stain on your name and, you know, certain people in certain circles won't even touch you because of that specific scenario. So it's like, geez, it's like a whole other layer of BS on top of everything else you have to go through at your job. It's crazy. Yeah, that it is. And, and, and that this, these are, these are predators. These are predators. They're in a position and they know they can get away with it. So it's very much like the Hollywood story where, you know, where women are coming out now about, um, about Weinstein and, and, and the likes that, you know, that these guys took advantage of female um, actresses and they wanted to be put in a role. And again, they had to think about it. Like if I call this guy out, I might be right, but do I ever get, do I ever get another role ever again? You know, and and I know that for some people they, they do. Well, there's no, you know, there's no, there's no uh, decision there. You just do the right thing, and it's like, well, it's easy for you to say because your career doesn't depend on, on your actions. And so, yes, well, we can sit back and be the armchair morality police and go, oh, well, you just do the right thing. That's what you do. <laughs> and, and with, but yeah, um, imagine being in a position where you have to make a decision. And your entire existence in your industry weighs on it. So if I make the wrong decision, it's not just I'm not going to teach anymore at this school. I'm not going to teach anywhere, period, right. ever again, which is kind of difficult because being a teacher is all I know. Um, you know, if I, oh man, if I, if, I, if I make the wrong decision, not only am I not driving a truck for this company, 
I'm not driving a truck ever again for anyone, which is kind of rough for me because all I've ever been it has been a truck driver. I know nothing else. So yeah, if you want to try to put yourself in those shoes, put yourself in those shoes for real and look at decisions that you would have to make that would have possibly get you tossed from your industry that you are oh so comfortable in and gashing your paychecks from. And then you can understand the decision that an actress has to make while sitting on a casting couch. Right. I think that's a great point that you make because when these people do think, you know, in those terms, they only think, oh, well, if I got fired from that company, I'd just go get another trucking job somewhere. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Except what if you couldn't, what if they barred you from the entire industry? Like you just said, and that's the way you have to think about it. Not just, oh, well, I would just go get another job because these people don't have that ability because once they're shunned from that, they're mm -hmm. never going to be allowed back in. They're blackballed for life. Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's how the, that industry works. And I mean, unfortunately, that's how other play, that's how other, other industries work too. You don't have to be a superstar to get blackballed from, <laughs> from, from what you're doing. So yeah, it's, it's, uh, it is a very daunting decision that unfortunately too many, many people have to find themselves making. So do you see the colleges around, around, uh, the country um, starting these programs where people like you are able to come in and talk to uh, fraternity members, talk about sexual assault, what it is, how to prevent it, you know, what it means to, to, to get consent. Um, do you see most colleges with programs like that and set up where people like you who actually listen to the people who come to you? Yeah, I think you're starting to see it at, at, at at some places. Um, there's a college, um, Williamette Will University, they, their men's basketball team, um, their coaches make it a point to teach healthy masculinity behaviors to their players. Um, they want their players to be good, not only good players, but good people. So they teach you know, healthy masculinity behavior with the same priority you know, that they teach a jump shot. Um, at, at my school, and, and I, I'm over at IUS, um, but at my school, um, our athletic department, you know, this year we're doing um, sexual prevention training with every single team. Um, and then also doing green dot training as well, which is the bystander intervention training. So kind of, okay, if you see something, say something, help your, your, your fellow student or your fellow person out in these situations. Um, th that's going to be the entire athletic department that's doing that. Um, at U of L, um, you know, I know that they spend some time working with their fraternity men specifically. Um, and, and it's, it's really impressive whenever you consider that, you know, they have a, they have a really small shop over there. Um, so there's a, a very few people doing a lot of things. So it's very, um, it's very great to see that they're taking on, um, you know, all of these hundred guys um, to do education with them properly. Um, Eastern Kentucky University, they have a program called Greek 101 that they do um, at the beginning of each year for every new incoming uh, member, whether you're a female or a male, um, that addresses, you know, this material along with, um, you know, alcohol safety and whatnot. So you're seeing it, you're, you're, you're seeing it pop up in different ways, you know, in different places. And I think that, I, I think it's fantastic. Um, I will always, I'm, I'm going to be that guy that always says we could be doing more. Um, you know, I feel like we can never not do enough. Um, but, you know, I think it takes, I think what it takes is to have people that really consider themselves advocates in this position. You can do this work to check the boxes off and that's fine. But if you approach it like you're really trying to make a change, that's when you really start spending a little bit of time with your students and with your staff and your faculty. And that's really when you get the real um, landmark programs that are being put together. Okay, so I have a statement and I have a question. And let's see, which sure. one, I'll do the statement first. I love what you're doing and I think it's important. It's extremely important that we have more people like you who know how to deliver the message. It, that, you know, there's the old saying, don't shoot the messenger. Well, sometimes I think maybe you should because the, the, 
the way they're <laughs> delivering the message, they're doing more harm than they are good to the very, you know, the very you know, uh, activity that they're trying to promote. And, uh, and, and I feel bad because I go, you're not helping, you're hurting. And, yeah. uh, and so it's nice to have people like you out there who, who understand the importance of not just the message, but how do people receive the message? How do I need to deliver that message so that it enacts change, not just say I'm right. So thank you. Uh, and my question was like, what do you think of, uh, I know you're from Louisville, but what do you think of uh, Coach K and the and Duke and the program he had there with his players? Man, we could talk all day about Duke. Uh, <laughs> we could talk all day about um, about Duke. Now, admittedly, um, you know, for obvious reasons, you know, I, I tend to kind of keep my eye on the lacrosse program right. a little bit more, uh, a little bit more, but. Oh yeah, we can talk all day uh, about the about the Blue Devils. Um, Let me ask you, talking about the lacrosse team. So those boys were all found innocent. Mm -hmm. Okay, is and and I know sometimes there are behind the scenes things that go on that the public never never learns about, and so what's portrayed isn't necessarily the truth. Were they truly innocent? Were they, you know, from your, from what you know, were they truly innocent and in what they were accused of? Uh, or was there some truth to what, you know, the girls said, or. I mean, that's what the court said. Uh, the court, the, the, the court said, uh, it, the, the Duke story is just so. If, if you're, a, if you're a true crime fanatic, um, the Duke story is just so interesting, and and I would recommend anyone that's listening that's interested or, or that's your cup of tea um, to go um, and find it, it's a documentary called um, uh, Fantastic Lies. I, I think that's what it's called, Fantastic Lies. Um, it, it, ESPN. Uh, produced it. I think it may be actually one of their 30 for 30s. So if you have that awesome ESPN Disney Plus Hulu package, um, <laughs> then you should have that for free and you can check that out. Um, but it's a very, very interesting situation because, you know, there were so many different lines that were being drawn in that case. On one side, you have the Duke lacrosse team the blue bloods, the rich kids, the, the, the people that we have always been told, oh, those are the douchebags over there. Right. Um, and then you have, um, you, you have an African-American woman who, um, you know, was an exotic dancer, um, which, you know, we've always been told, oh, exotic dancers usually have, a lot of issues going on and that's not a um a respectable thing to do which i mean you know that's hogwash but that's what we've you know always kind of been told so you kind of have these two areas kind of going at it and it was very interesting to see how the entire you know community you know got involved the entire community kind of got involved there and you know you picked a side for better or worse. You picked a side. Um, I, I'm sure it was a very interesting atmosphere on, on campus while that was going on. Do I believe, you know, that they were truly innocent? I'm, I'm going to take the, uh, I'm going to take the, the legal way out of this and say that um, for me to make that decision, I, I'm a person where I need to see, I need to see all the evidence before I can make a decision like that. Um, you know, surely you're not seeing everything in a one hour documentary on ESPN. So I need to kind of see a little bit more of the evidence to, uh, to make that decision. But, you know, it, it was, it, it's an interesting one. And like I said, that's a good documentary for anyone who wants to check that out. Well, I'm going to throw one more case up to you and I'm not going to be a lawyer because I'm not a lawyer and I'm not as diplomatic as you are my friend. So <laughs> <laughs> that gets me in trouble sometimes, but that's okay. The, the case that made me the angriest was the case against Mike Tyson. Mm -hmm. He went to jail and from all the evidence that I had seen, I was like, this is nonsense. 
it's at the very most it's his word against her word and they decided to take her word and mm-hmm. i go how there is absolutely zero proof whatsoever that he did what she said and there is proof that she attempted to blackmail him for money and mm-hmm. you still sent him to prison how i don't it, it, see to me that's one of those things where you just simply took the woman's you know and, and you know, I'll go even further. I'll say it's because Mike Tyson wasn't the right kind of black man. He was too black. He was, too, you know, he was, you know, he had his anger issues or whatever. He's a boxer and, and he didn't fit the mold. He wasn't an OJ Simpson. He wasn't a lighter color black man. He wasn't somebody who was out on the golf course, you know, and, and, and things of that nature. And so I just don't think he was treated like, you know, everybody knows OJ did it. That man walked. Because he did it and he walked and and then here's a man who i truly believe didn't do it and goes to prison you know and so what do you I think <laughs> what are your thoughts i think i may have been in second grade when that happened um and i <laughs> i'll never <laughs> i'll never forget i was in second grade and i was sitting next to my my best friend at the time adam carroll and here are two second graders like, what is, what is rape? Like, we're, we're trying to figure out, like, what, what, is, what do they keep saying? Like, what did he do? Like, we don't understand. And, like, no one, no one would explain it to us. Um, it was very frustrating uh, being a second grader at Fairmont Elementary um, that year. But, um, no, you know, I think with situations like, you know, with, with situations like this, there, there's another case that happened um, – there's another case that happened at Purdue, um, and this is something that I'm more familiar with, but it's, I think it's just the exact same thing. Um, and um, Amy, Co- Amy Coney Barrett, right, yeah. um, this is one of the, the cases I think that she's most known for, where they, you know, Purdue, they, they, they found this guy, um, they found this guy responsible for sexual misconduct, but you know it was just done in such a way where you know he 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 didn't get to call any witnesses. He got to present no evidence. Um, it was you know due process was just not done here, and it just kind of makes you wonder. It's like okay, well, why would you why would you hear a case in that manner? Right, like. Don't you want to try to get to the bottom of what happened? If you do your due diligence and you look at your evidence, you know, and and you got a brain in your head, you're going to come up with what truly happened. Um, You you don't have to rush to a a, a verdict like that. Um, But this was, you know, completely rushed and, you know, what this wound up doing was now you have, now you have a, a student that may have been sexually assaulted, but now you also have the students who, whose due process rights were, 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 were abused as well. So now you've just like made two wrongs out of one potential wrong. Um, for me, justice, for me, justice is, is making a decision based off the evidence. Um, that decision may not always be what we want it to be but that's what i think you're supposed to do my very last uh hearing case that i had at u of l there was there was uh, there were two there were two people that were off at a um they were out of town in a education conference and you know, their stories were parallel to a point. Um, the stories were parallel that they went out to eat. They had some drinks with dinner. Um, you know, they had a few more drinks and then they wound up in his um, hotel room. Now, this is where the story kind of goes in two directions. She states that she does not remember a single thing that happened from that point until eight o'clock the next morning. 
his side of the story is the opposite, extremely detailed, extremely detailed to the point where you are starting to question and think to yourself, this is a little bit too polished. Right. You're saying some things to me that normal people probably would not have said at that time or in that position. What it comes across to me is, is that you are reading a statement that someone more than likely your attorney has prepared for you to get on this phone and to pair it back to me. Also, somewhere in this whole thing, now we didn't ask for this information, but it was brought up by him that he is on the sex offender list here in Kentucky. So now every the the red lights are are doing this in the, in the room. Um, but then we go back and we talk to her again and ask like, you can't give us anything. You can't tell us anything that happened. She's like, I, I wish that I could. I wish I could tell you something, but I literally was out. I cannot remember a single thing except getting in the shower the next day. We asked several times and it was still the same thing from her. So despite the fact that everyone in that room was convinced that this guy was lying about something in, in this whole scenario, what, what can we do other than find him not responsible if we have zero evidence on the other end? Did you take a, a, a drug test or anything to see if he had slipped her uh, a retinol or, or wait, what is it? Not retinol. It's um, what's it? drug called a roofie that oh. yeah and then this the time frame of this was so this had, so the thing about title nine um in college is there's really no statute of limitations to these things mm -hmm. so you you something could happen to you as a freshman and you could bring it up as a senior and we still hear it oh, gotcha. um, so there's no statute of limitations so this this person had actually already had graduated um, graduated the school and had been out for about a year and a half. Um, when we asked, why are you just now bringing it this to us? She was like, well, you know, I was at a, I think she was like at a take back the night, um, you know, ceremony or something. And that really kind of inspired her to, to bring it back to us, which is fine. Like I said, I mean, we will hear all cases um, regardless of the time frame on it, but yeah, like if we don't have any evidence, we have no choice but to rule in the other direction. And I'll tell you, Kurt, man, it, I didn't feel good walking away from that thing. I, 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 we all felt bad. We all felt really just, just crummy walking away from it. But we looked at the facts that were presented. We looked at the facts that were given and based on those facts and those facts alone, we made the decision that we had to make. So how all this ties back into Mike Tyson, um, you know, as someone who is out to look for justice, like you, you kind of wish that people would take maybe the same standard right. uh, when looking at when looking at cases. Um, it's not. Let, let's take it outside of the realm of. Let's take it outside of the realm of sexual assault, murder. If you're going to charge me with murder, then there damn sure better be evidence that I you know, you killed this person, you know? So it's frustrating. It's kind of frustrating when you hear those judicial decisions, even as an advocate, it's, it's frustrating when you hear those judicial decisions that are made, um, but maybe they don't really match up with um, the evidence and you can kind of see different spots where they could have done a little bit more. Well, I, don't you think that maybe one of the things that makes it more challenging for, you know, sexual offenses compared to murders that if someone's murdered, it's, it's investigated right then and there, they realize, Hey, there's a murder. Well, let's investigate it. But when you, when you don't have victims show up until weeks, months, years later, like in, in this case with this woman. Um, and, and again, I can understand that. So it's not to place fault on them. But is there, is there 
something that you want to tell them to say, look, I understand that you may will not want to come forward in the beginning, but the sooner you do it, the better, because if you, if, if this truly happened, you're going to, it's going to be extremely hard for us to prove this years down the road. That's one thing that I kind of, that, that is one thing that I kind of get across is like, look, I, I, I get it. The, the trauma of what has happened. I mean, that's heavy trauma. Um, and there are, there are all types of reasons why someone may not be ready to um, come forward at that time. Um, I think it's it's a very tone deaf statement to to look at someone and say, "Well, why didn't you report it right whenever it happened?" I'm like, because I mean, shit. Sometimes it takes sometimes it takes a little bit for you to process what has happened. Um, now that being said. It certainly makes our job a lot easier um, if you know you go and you you know you do a rape kit or you make a report right whenever it happened. Because I mean, I think you know if you sit down and look at it practically, it's like okay, my memory might be a little bit better to recall something for you five minutes after I saw it versus if I have to recall something for you a year down the line. Not saying I can't do it, but you know, there might be little details that I may have forgotten, but those details might be imp- might be important. So, yeah, I think it's practical, but then on the other end, I mean, there's even I mean, th- there are numerous situations where even when a person does come forward right whenever it happens, they still get the shaft when it comes to the uh, judicial decision. So, you know, like I said, it's difficult for people to, um, it's difficult for people to report. And when people talk about not trusting the system or not trusting the process, you know, those are people that either have heard where someone did everything that they were supposed to do. They reported everything that they were supposed to report. And in the end, none of it even mattered or that has happened to them themselves, um, unfortunately. When, while you were talking, something that popped in my head that might help is because, like you said, it, there's so many reasons why people don't come forward in the beginning. What what you might, and I don't know, maybe you already do this, is is if we could get them to say, look, you may not, if, if this ever happens to you, you don't know how it's going to affect you. And mm-hmm. it may it may wear on you in a way that you just don't want to come forward but write down everything that you can remember now write it down and keep it so that way the details won't slip your mind a year or two years down the road or if it does you'll have it written down so you can remember it we we have i think we i think it's fine to make that blanket statement but we what we have to never lose sight of You know, and this is something, you know, for me that I had to learn in the very beginning doing this work is that at the end of the day, I'm not driving the car here. You're the one that's driving the car. I'm here to ride shotgun with you and to help. But ultimately, you're the one driving the car. And our journey in this as a conduct matter it can go as far as you want to drive it to, or it can be a very short trip. Um, but it's not my, it's not on me to reach my foot over and step on the gas for you. Right. Um, I just have to, I have to be beside you um, and kind of be your help and your navigation system for whichever direction that you want to go in. And sometimes, man, I tell you, that can be difficult, especially depending on what the case is. Because you're just like, oh, my God, I cannot believe that happened. We've got to investigate this. We've got them because if this is true, we need to fix we need to fix this. And it's so frustrating. And it's like, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to make a report about it for whatever reason. It's like, oh, you just want to <laughs> shake somebody sometimes. But it's like, no, you, you, you got to you got to back off and you have to respect people's decisions. Um, you know, in scenarios like this, um, because, you know, people have reasons for, you know, not wanting to report. So you have to be respectful of that. All right. So, so we've identified the problem that there's absolutely a problem on college campuses throughout the country. I mean, if there's one in four, 
and you're talking 25 percent of, of of students throughout the country are are going to experience you know sexual assault on some level um that's the that's certainly a huge problem so with kids getting ready to go back to school or go to go to college for the first time what's some of the things that you would advise them to to do in order to prevent them from being that one in four well even before we talk about the college kids let's talk about the middle school kids and the high school kids this is when it's time for you to get educated on sexual misconduct and understand what is right and what is wrong. And I understand that, like, you're probably thinking to yourself, like, geez, Louis, like middle school? That's all. That's, it's exactly what I'm thinking. Middle school? How old are they in middle school? Like, young. but this, I mean, but really, that is, those are your formative years. And this is when we can start talking about some of these healthy behaviors. But we don't, let me break, let me, let me, let me tell you a story, kind of break it down so you, maybe you see what I'm saying. My daughter, when she was leaving preschool, so she's in second grade right now. So a few years ago, she's leaving her preschool to go, um, you know, on summer vacation. And this is the last time she's going to see any of her preschool friends and everything like that. Um, so on the last day, she's like hugging everyone. Now, I'm 6'2". My ex-wife is about five nine or five ten so my daughter is tall she hulks over these other children the boys too so she's going around giving her hugs out and i mean when she's hugging these kids she is lifting them off of the ground like their feet are dangling and like it's cute and everything like that but you know event like you know we get in the car and it's like okay i know you're a hugger and that's cool. And yeah, I know that's how you express affection. But here's the thing. You, we need to make sure that we ask people before we hug them. We need to make sure that they are okay with being hugged because some people don't like to be hugged. Not That doesn't mean you're a bad person. Doesn't mean you suck. That they don't like you. To some people, it's not their jam. So maybe if your friend Tom doesn't like to be hugged, maybe, he, maybe he's a high ball type of guy. Uh, maybe he's a handshake. I'm just saying, broaden your signs of affection and make sure that you that people are okay with getting a hug from you. So, okay, I got it, I got it. And it's like, you know, even, even at that age, it's like you can understand consent. Right. Maybe, maybe you don't have to frame it as, you know, all the way in the sexual um, manner of things, but we're already teaching kids consent, aren't we? Like, Class, if you want to use the bathroom, you have to raise your hand and you have to get permission. So you have to get consent to go to the bathroom, right? So we, there's ways to teach younger younger kids consent, but I really think that we need to start doing that earlier in middle school. Now, I learned sex education in eighth grade. I'm not sure when they teach it now, but <clears throat> I remember being in eighth grade um, eighth grade, Mrs. Wells's class, her teaching us sex education. Sex ed in high school has, or in middle school, has always traditionally only focused on the biology of sex. Um, what the parts are called, you know, this goes, you know, this is what happens when this cell meets this cell. Um, but the biology of sex is taught, but the social side of it is never taught. So what about a sex ed class that teaches you what consent is, teaches you what sexual assault is, um, teaches you what the law in your state says about these specific things? If you're old enough to figure out how biology works and, okay, sperm goes in egg and then baby comes in nine months, then I think you can understand, hey, but before any of that, you have to make sure you have the permission of the person that you're about to have sex with. Tupac had this awesome quote that like, I, if I wasn't terrified of needles, I would get tattooed on my body somewhere. <laughs> um, but he's like, we need to have like a real sex ed class, not just a class with all these, you know, illogical terms, but a real sex ed class. And I always took that to mean a class that talks about the social side of things and talks about the consequences 
um, that come, you know, from things as well. And that's not just sexual assault, but that's like, hey, if you have a child and you're 14 and you're a child yourself, here is what comes after that. Like uh, something that really breaks down everything with sex. So I think that, you know, those are conversations that could be had at a younger age. Um, for seniors that are about to go into high school, this is the time to really start. If you haven't had a conversation of what, um, you know, sex and healthy sexual behavior looks like in college, now's the time to have it. Trinity High School here in um, here in Kentucky, one of the most prestigious and and proper, you know, and best schools in the whole state. Um, Every, every year I go in and I speak to their senior capstone course. Now this is a capstone course where they teach the students like soft skills for after high school. So, you know, time management, how to make a grocery list, uh, financials. But one of the units they do is, is sex education in, in college. And when I meet with them, I tell them right up front, I have about an hour and 15 minutes with you guys. We are not going to solve sexual assault in an hour and 15 minutes. But what we can do is have a conversation about what this is going to look like in college. Um, because in college, there's, college is the most fun four years of your life for a reason, because there are a million different social things that go on. Tailgates, house parties, frat parties, dorm parties, kickbacks, step show, like, everything happens and there's usually booze at those things like booze is very easy to come by in college and there's also another thing called college girls that i understand seniors of this all boys school that you haven't been around that much for the past four years but it's about to be a culture shock for you so let's talk about how you can go through college and still indulge in all of this fun stuff but do it in a safe and responsible way. And I think that that conversation is really great for seniors as they're about to go in to college because um, that's the mark that they miss. For parents, it's important that parents understand the Title IX policy on whatever campus their kid's about to go to. Because here's the thing, regardless of how old your child is, whether they're eight, they're eight or 18 or 28, they may consider themselves, ooh, I'm a big adult. But when tragedy strikes, they're still coming to you, mom, or you, dad, first. Even at 38, when things go awry, I pick up the phone, mom, uh, what does it mean when there's smoke coming out of the hood and the air ducts in the car? So get the hell out of the car. Um, so even still at 38, I still call my mom. Um, but it's important for you guys to know kind of what your university does and what the process is. Um, we give students student handbooks all the time and we say, read this, this it's got a lot of important stuff. They never read it. They just throw it out. They don't look at the student handbook. Um, but it's important for you, mom and dad, to look at that so that if something does happen, you're prepared and you're ready to jump into, okay, this is what we need to do. We need to go find the Title IX coordinator and help you know, kind of guide your child if they come to you. So that's something good for parents to kind of start looking into as well. And personally, I feel like high schools should do sessions like that with parents. Maybe I just came up with a brand new idea of things that we can do in Kentucky. Yeah, I think you did. I think, you know, I think you're right about, you know, I think most parents, most of us would want there to be a sex education course taught about, uh, something other than just the biology of it, you know, mm -hmm. like how to handle sex and, 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 you know, and consent and things of that nature, they, they need to learn that stuff. And it's not, you know, it, you can't do like what, what we attempted to do on the war on drugs, which is just say no, because that's right. the, the attitude a lot, of, a lot of these school boards take is, well, you know, you just tell these kids, you don't have sex until you get married. <laughs> Well, that's not, you know, that's unlikely to happen for most right. of the students. And so to ignore that as if, oh, well, I did my job. I told them not to have sex and I'm done. You know, that's, yeah. that's, you know, irresponsible as far as I'm concerned. 
it, it can be a rough situation for a parent to have with a kid. Like, I mean, I do, I do this stuff every day as my job and I'm still kind of like, all right, uh, I know that here in about here in a few years, I'm going to have to sit Blair down and we're going to have to talk about this stuff. And how do I do it? You know, do I do do I come in and, and, and do, am I attorney daddy at this point or do I come in and, and do I try to like make it soft? Like or do I just like how do I go in and do this? And I'm sure there's a lot of other parents who feel the same way. Awkward talking to their children about sex because that's an awkward conversation. Um, imagine if you didn't have to do it, though. Right. Imagine if that was just being taught in our school system or you know, you're, the school is bringing like a guest speaker like me in to kind of have those conversations, then that might make the communication that you have with your child later on a little bit easier because someone else has already done the first step of it. And now your son or daughter at least has a base knowledge to where you can take it further. So I think that it will help. But I also think that families could make it less awkward by not making sex such a taboo thing which is what in this country that's what we've always done it's like something that's taboo you know there's a there's been this discussion um yeah. for years of, as to whether or not we should quit um circumcising young boy you know baby boys in this country and i go no i don't think we should and here's why because the parents don't even want to admit their boy has a penis, let alone have to teach them how to clean it and stuff. They don't want to be the ones go, oh, this is how you clean it and don't clean it too much. And all this. they don't want to they they like to pretend that they don't do those sort of things. And now yeah. you and I both know that's ridiculous, but that's the, that's the, you know how they look at. It. They're not going to admit that their kids do anything until it's brought in front of them to where they have to you know they have to admit it. Talking about sex is taboo, and as such, talking about sex, sexual assault prevention and sexual assault, period, in some areas is even taboo. There are law schools right now in the country that have decided to not teach units on sex crimes. Now, murder, arson, assault, all of that's cool, but apparently sex crimes is where some law student or law schools are starting to draw the line because um, you know, there, in some instances, students have complained and have said, oh, well, you know, this is just a difficult and traumatizing subject to, to talk about, which, like I said, blows my mind because there are, there's other traumatizing things you're going to talk about in law school. You kind of have to get the thick skin to handle that because you have to know the law if you're going to be an attorney. Um, but law schools, rather than deal with the issue, are just saying, well, screw it. We're not going to teach, you know, we're not going to teach sex crimes. And that just blows my mind um, because whenever I went into criminal law, uh, the class for the first time, our professor, when it got to the sex crimes unit, um, you know, our professor, he told us that, hey, schools are, are starting to shy away from this. They're not teaching this. But our law school is not going to be one of them. You will learn these, these, this unit here because how can you change the world if you don't know what you're trying to change? Exactly. So, yeah, let's stop, let's stop making this stuff taboo and get to changing. I agree. And I, and I like the way you handled your daughter because I remember a case a few years back where some little boy – like he was, he was either in kindergarten or he might have been in preschool. But he went up and he kissed this little girl, and they made this federal case about it as if he should be charged with sexual assault or something. I go, what? You know, the kid, it, it was innocent. Obviously, there's nothing sexual about it when you're four or five years old, and it, and it was just some innocent thing that he did. And again, like what you did with your daughter said, you know, some people may not like being hugged and you have to ask for consent. And I'm sure that's all the little boy needed instead of me to feel guilty about kissing a little girl that he, you know, that was just an innocent, you know, peck on the cheek or whatever, or, or I don't remember if he kissed her on the lips or not, but it's not like he slipped her tongue or something. So it's yeah. like a little peck, you know, and it was an innocent gesture and, and the adults, made it into this, you know, third degree felony that just didn't need to be. 
there, there might be some people that are listening right now saying to themselves, are you serious? Like, you, you got to ask for permission for a hug up. Like, that's ridiculous. But it, it, as you just said, look what it can lead to. It doesn't have to be a big deal whenever you talk to your kids about this stuff. It doesn't have to be a big production. It doesn't have to be a, like, come on, junior, let's go sit on the back porch. It can be like literally a 30 second little, hey, so for next time, just remember, like it's just taking little things like that and turning them into teachable moments for your kids. That That's it. You know, it doesn't have to be it doesn't have to be this this big thing. And you'll be surprised at how smart your kids are. Whenever you say things to them, I, I say stuff to my kid all the time and I, I'll, I'll look at her and I'm sitting there thinking like, she's not even paying attention. Like she is just <laughs> oh, off in la la land. But then I'll be like, what did I just say? And she'll repeat it like word for word. I'm like, oh, okay, <laughs> cool. So yeah, like let's not make a big political, you know, argument and fight about this. Like I said, just, it's just turning little moments into learn into learning um, into learning moments, and that's what we should be doing with kids, anyways. Is teaching them from the time that they, you know, are born to the time you can no longer teach them anymore. Right, and and I completely agree with you. I don't know what's taken this country so long to realize that every time we make something taboo, you know, like we make it so that you know kids can't drink. And so, of course, whenever they can get their hands on alcohol, they go crazy, like, like, oh, we're not supposed to do this, so let's do it, and let's do it to excess, because we may not be able to do it again for some time. And so they, you know, they don't learn how to handle alcohol reasonably or drugs reasonably, you know, over in, over in Europe, where, you know, it's nothing for kids to drink, a, you know, a, a glass of wine or a small glass of wine, you know, not a full glass, but some wine with their dinner. It's nothing because, you know, 16 year olds are allowed out at the, uh, at the clubs and stuff and they can drink, but they have such stringent rules about drinking and driving that they, they, you know, you don't see DUIs over there very often because they are so strict about it, but they're also not crazy about it because they're taught about, being responsible with alcohol as a kid instead of you know having it kept from them and we do right. the same thing with sex we you know we want to pretend that our kids don't have sex and we want to keep them from it as long as possible and of course if, you know if we say well don't have sex till you know till you're married and and that's that that's the rule you hear me johnny don't you have sex until you get married yeah <laughs> do, think, do we really think that's going to happen honestly if we're being logical about it I, my my former brother-in-law, um, we years ago, me and him went shooting together, and you know the w- him and I, we were we we're uh, you know on two different ends of the political the political sphere, but you know one thing we we were talking about like gun safety, right? Mm-hmm. And I was like, so I was like, Doug, how do you so how do you do this with your kids? Because you have three children. Um, of, of varying, varying age ranges, but like, you know, like guns in the house, how does this work for you? And what he said was like, well, he's like, here's the thing. I make sure that I teach my kids about this stuff. I teach them about gun safety. I teach them, Hey, if you ever see daddy's gun laying out, which you never will, but if for some reason you do, you're not to touch it year to go and get one of us um and he's like and then i'll like i i break it down you know i break it down to them i i show them you know like here here are the pieces of you know of a gun here is what a gun does like so where it's because like you said you know it's like okay well if all i know as a kid is that ooh, there's something in this box under the bed that I've been told I'm not supposed to ever go around and that's all I know about it, then what's the very first thing you're going to do whenever mom and dad go to the grocery store and leave you home alone? You're going under the bed, you're getting that gun, and you're probably shooting yourself because you don't know what's going on. But, you know, the way he broke it down, it's like I educate them. 
And so they understand why guns are. Whoa, Ooh. it's raining here. In, <laughs> it's raining here in Kentucky, so I just scared the hell out of me. Um, big lightning. Um, but he's like, yeah, my kids understand why guns are dangerous. They understand the consequences of, of guns, and that just makes things a lot smoother. So yeah. it's like, what if we took that yeah. approach? Yeah, what if we took that approach with everything? This is a, this the, you know. Let's teach them about sex and and parents. You've got to get off of this. You know, about being embarrassed as if sex is a bad thing. It's not. And it's it's a it's a it's not only not a bad thing. It's a natural thing. And yeah. once kids hit puberty, you're not going to stop that. I, I'm sorry, you're just not going to stop it. Yeah, I would have much rather have learned this from like people that I was close to. I grew up in the 90s. So I learned about sex from watching Married with Children, Roseanne, Martin, anything that Fox had on the television. And then the stack of Playboys that my neighbor kept in his backyard. Like, that's probably not the best way to learn about this stuff. So, you know, maybe, yeah, maybe mom and dad, we, you can have that conversation. Um, you can have that conversation with them. And I think it's just as important as it is for us to come up with educational programs for kids. Once again, it's important to come up with educational programs for parents. Um, like, I want to talk to my kid. How do I do it? Like, don't be ashamed if you don't know how to, you know, approach your, your child on a specific subject. Instead, figure out how to do it so you can do it. Right. And that's the thing. And don't, and if you don't know how to do it, learn how to do it. Because, you know, I grew up much earlier than you. And so the way my parents, or I should say my father handled it was to, you know, he found some, some magazines and where I hid them when I was like, uh, I don't know, about 12 or so, maybe a little bit older. And my neighbor and I found these magazines out in the woods. So we brought them back and we're going to look at them, you know? So somehow or another, I got stuck holding on to them. Well, I hid them, but one day my father found them. And so he, he made it seem as if we were dirty. He made it seem as if we were, you know, delinquents. And, and, and so I'm trying to blame my neighbor. My neighbor's trying to blame me, my, and you know, because we don't want to get in trouble. You know, we're little kids and we're like, and the wrath is coming down on us. And if my father had just taken the time to, to talk to me about it, instead of trying to make me feel bad about it, there was such a great opportunity there to teach me what I needed to know. But instead, because he didn't know how to do that, he did only what he, what he knew how to do. I would just say for parents that are listening, you know, here's the thing. Your kids are going to find out about sex one way or the other. Oh, yeah. um, and it, it, and it's far easier for them to find out about it in 2021 than it was in 1991. Back then, all you had to worry about was them finding your stash under the bed or in the closet. But now every kid has a dang on smartphone and it's just a moment of, it's just a moment of time before one kid at school is talking about the hub. And now your kid is pulling up porn on their cell phone. Um, you know, so they're going to find out about it at some sooner than you probably think. So don't you want to get ahead of that and, and right. help narrate that conversation a little bit more, maybe in the way you want it to go, rather than just being alone in the wilderness, so to speak, like, you know, exactly. Do you want your kids to learn about sex from you or do you want them to learn about it from porn? Honestly, do you, do you want that? <laughs> because I don't, I know I wouldn't. And, and don't, you know, you can't guilt p children into, to where you can make them feel bad. You're going to make them feel bad, but it's not going to guilt them into where they don't want to know about sex. So if you say you were looking at this porn, do you like this? Do you like this? And of course the kid's going to go, no, no, I don't like it. You know, I mean, I don't, I don't, I just, it just popped up. Like, you know, of course he or she liked it. That's why he or she was watching it. <laughs> you know, so yeah. to try to, to get them to deny liking it, you're, you you feel like you've won this battle, but you haven't. You just, the, the kid lied to save their ass, you know, which. You know, I'm doing some work right now with uh, Down Syndrome of Louisville um, because, you know, we, we wrote an article 
many months ago about sexual assault in the um, uh, the the disabled the disabled community, and you know one of the things in all of the planning that we've done um, is to encourage parents to not dance around the conversation. So if you're talking about a penis, call it a penis. Right. If you're talking about a vagina, call it a vagina. Don't call it a hoo-ha or a winky or whatever silly things we call it. Call it by its term because Lord forbid, knock on wood, hope it never happens. But if it does to where you have to go into an attorney's office to describe a situation that happened. We don't want you to be confused whenever someone's saying, did they touch your vagina? Did what, what happened with their penis? Like we want you to know these terms so that you can better equip yourself. Um, if anything were to ever happen, right. um, and, and so some of the work that I've been doing with DSL has just really been like, we need to, we need to take this stance across the board, not just with, you know, our, our, our disabled boys and girls or men and women across the board, because this is just common sense. This, these are common sense moves that we're making. Right. And I'll go back to what you said that, you know, what Tupac, what Tupac said, and I agree with you. I think that, I hope you're able to work on that and, and, and get that across the country where, where they actually have real sex ed education for kids and learn about these things. You know, I know that it's either Kentucky or Tennessee or maybe both for, oh, I think it's Kentucky though. Like they, they want to ban. Uh, and I think they did that. You can't talk about homosexuality. So it's as if, if you don't talk about homosexuality, then it doesn't exist. Oh, wow. Yeah, <laughs> it's like, you know, it's like, okay, well, I guess it just disappears then, you know, and and, yeah. so it, and so kids who are gay, you know, they're, they're, they don't receive any honest dialogue about what it means to be gay, what it, you know, what that whole thing looks like for them. And there's no, yeah. there's no honesty spoken there. And, um, and you just, you're hurting the children. I mean, you're hurting kids when you don't educate them because you're afraid of it because you because you think sex is taboo and and you don't want to and you don't want to have to speak about it you want the school to do it but you want the school to do it in a bio in in the biological biological way only it's like yeah. you know we we see what i was gonna say what do you think's gonna happen but we see what happens <laughs> so well for any parents that are listening right now and are going through it I feel for you. I'm with you. And you at least got me to where if you ever need, you know, to like say, hey, how do I start this conversation? You can reach out and I can maybe kind of give you some some pointers on, you know, how to get the conversation started. Because, I mean, parents, we, we, we parents got to take care of parents. Right. So. Right. Well, OK. So with that being said. Parents, James just offered you the opportunity to reach out to him and ask him. So if you don't, if you don't know how to, to address your kids about these subject matters, please reach out to him and, and ask him. And so that way you do more good for your child than you do harm. And, and that's, yeah. what, that's what we really all want as parents. James, mm -hmm. so how can people get a hold of you? Now, again, let's keep in mind that you wrote the book, uh, Title, uh, Title Nine Guy. Where can people find your book? Where can people find you, your social media, all that? I mean, I'll, I'll put it in, in, in the links below, but just so if someone's listening on the road right now and they, they hear it, they want to go, oh, let me check it out. So the title line guy, got the book right here. This is what, what it looks like. It's, a, it's, just, it's about 177 pages, so not a super long read, but a lot of good knowledge and on a variety of different topics, everything from – um, from male victims with teachers to hazing to silly things that lawyers and politicians have said about sexual assault in the past. There's something in here for everybody. Uh, you can get it from Amazon. Um, it's right now it's on the bestseller list uh, in the in the uh, gender and law genre. Um, so you can grab a copy on Amazon. Uh, if I have anyone that's listening locally, and when I say local, I mean Louisville or Southern Indiana. 
Um, we're in Carmichael's bookstore and Mickey's, um, Mickey's Uptown in, um, in uh, New Albany, Indiana. Also for any students listening on your college campuses, um, the, we're making moves to get the book in your library. So, um, you know, it, if you're if you're in Dartmouth or Yale, or if you're in the University of Louisville or Indiana University Southeast, uh, it's in your library right now. And, and it's starting to pop up in more libraries um, around the country. So that might be a good spot for it too. Um, but yeah, Amazon's where you can get that. How you can get a hold of me? Uh, I am the Title Nine guy on Instagram, and that's probably the best route to go to get a hold of me at. Um, I post on there every day. I'm typically posting articles that I write, um, in addition to books I write for our local uh, newspaper, The Leo. Um, so they've been gracious enough to let me write about this stuff on a regular basis. So you can check out all of my articles um, and just keep tabs on kind of some of the schools I'll be at or the places I'll be doing lectures at through the Title IX guy on Instagram. And you also have that direct message link there too. So if there's ever any questions or, hey, Joey, I have a question about this. I really love to get your opinion on this. Feel free to reach out to me on the DM and I'll be more than happy to, to message, you, message you right back. Okay. And just to be clear on Instagram, it's Title IX in Rome. The nine is in Roman numerals, right? Right, the 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 nine is is Roman numerals in there. So I'm I'm the usually the very first thing that pops up. So very good. I was just because I didn't know if it'd pop up if they just put the regular number nine in, and so I wanted to make sure they could find you. So so yeah, so it's Roman numeral nine ix. And also, Kurt, while I'm while I'm promoting things, um, go ahead. Uh, if, if you go on YouTube, uh, I had the um, I had the privilege of giving a TED talk. Uh, for TEDx Bloomington back in April. Um, uh, it's called The Fruit of the Poisonous Tree. And it's really a, a, a deep dive into masculinity, like we were talking earlier on, healthy and toxic masculinity. So it's a really good breakdown of that. Um, it recently just hit YouTube. So it's on the, uh, the TEDx channel. Um, but honestly, you can just type my name in and, and TEDx Bloomington or Fruit of the Poisonous Tree and it should pull right up. So if you have 12 minutes, give it a watch and leave me some love on that video too. I think that's a, uh, it's, it, it was a really nice uh, opportunity to kind of put that message out there. Well, I'm going to go check it out and, uh, and I may ask you back on the show so we can talk about that topic a little bit more sure. in the detail. So um, I, because it's, it's something I think that's important again to get out there um, to the, to the masses so that we have a better understanding of what that means. So I'm with it. You let me know. I'll be here. Be here. <laughs> now I called you James. You keep going by Joey. Is that your nickname? Is that, or it so, so I am James Joseph Wilkerson. Uh, as a kid, everyone just called me Joey. Um, as in a, most of my adult life, everyone called me Joey, but whenever I was right, started writing, my mom said, Hey, you know, like you're, 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 you're starting all this writing stuff and you're about to go, you know, work this new job on the senior level. Like James sounds very dignified and you know, that's a good look. and I'm like, yeah, I guess James does sound like someone who you might listen to a little bit more than Joey. So I started writing under James Wilkerson, but then everyone called me Joey and it's just really confused the hell out of everyone I work with. As to what on earth do we call you? And I'm like, either one of them is fine. Um, it's just that when you Google Joey Wilkerson, You'll, you'll hear about my fraternity days. When you Google James Wilkerson, you'll hear about all my cool professional stuff. So um, I kind of wrote myself into a corner there. But Oh, boy. <laughs> well, I'm going to cover all my bases today. So I'm going to say, James Joseph Wilkerson, thank you so much for being on the show today. Um, I I loved your approach to this. And, I'm gl again, I'm glad that there are people like you out there, you know, moving this forward so that people can become educated and we and hopefully this becomes a problem of the past you know at some point so thank you for for all the work that you do and folks um i'll make sure that i have all his links down below so if you'd like to reach him or if you'd like to buy his book title nine guy uh you can you can do so you i'll i'll put the link down there for that as well so so uh 
again, thank you for joining us. And uh, folks, thank you for joining us. Uh, you have a wonderful day. And until next time, take care, be safe, and still wear your mask for now. <laughs>